Uh, we got kidnapped by our birth dad. He would keep us locked in this room and you know, starve us, beat us, molest us, all kind of crazy shit. And then later on that day, we were driving some more and I realized, oh, this is where I seen it out on the street. And then every time I would see graffiti, it would make me feel this, like this excitement in here, right? Or I just knew like, this is cool. It's making me feel something cool inside. I want to learn all about that. And I showed up, boom, he had a board for me. And then that was it, man. Once I stepped on that thing, it was over. I was like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. It wasn't even, I didn't show no tape, nothing. They just vouched for me and then boom, I was on Hurley. Literally, I'm gonna tell you right now, one fucking conversation can change your whole life. I'm from uh, San Diego, California. And uh, when I was a kid, me and my sister, uh, we got kidnapped by our birth dad. And uh, he took us to Guam and both my parents were uh, super heavy, like drug addicts, you know? And uh, you know, he would keep us locked in this room and you know, starve us, beat us, molest us, all kind of crazy shit. One night, I heard a woman's voice say, Ryan, it's time to go, you know? So I grabbed my sister and I remember we went in the kitchen, grabbed some like little boxes of raisins and the peanut butter and jelly that's in the same jar. And then we were out. And so uh, we just left in the middle of the night. We just kept walking, walking, ended up at a park, slept there. And then um, the next day we just hung out there all day. And then even I remember kids came with their parents playing and no one really kind of tripped that we were there on our own. You know, they just probably thought, oh, these kids are, their parents are somewhere. Yeah. Then it got dark and I remember getting kind of like nervous. And then the same thing, bro, that, that voice, Ryan, it's time to go. So I was like, all right. So I saw a house with the light on. I just walked straight to that house, knocked on the door. They called the cops. The cops came, picked us up asked us where we're from, and I showed them like, oh, we came from that direction. And I remember it was a lady cop, she was like, can you show me where exactly? I said, yeah, and we go to my house. And I remember watching them with flashlights, look in the house, no one was home. They took us to the hospital, we're all, you know, beat up, all fucked up. Our stomachs were all fat because we were full of worms and all kind of crazy shit. And then uh, my dad ends up coming, but they're like, oh, they're not going home with that guy. Fuck that. And so they sent us back to California. They put us in the system in CPS. My birth mom comes, but she's all cracked out. They're like, oh, they're not, you're not taking these kids either. Then we go to uh, like foster homes. And my mom now, she's from Hawaii, but she was a pastor in California. She had, you know, we're in a foster home. She adopted us. And then she moved us all back to Hawaii when I was seven. And then later on in life, I found out she moved back here because where we lived was kind of like real bad gang neighborhoods. And she kind of knew like, oh, I don't want these kids to try to find themselves within gangs later on in life because, you know, they're adopted and all that. So she moved us back here and we've been here ever since, man, you know? And thank God, like, she literally saved our lives and like, you know, I owe her everything. So I basically ran away from home and just never went back, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, when I was young, I, I would definitely share the story right off the, right out the gate because to me, I'm like, I mean, that's the truth. So I'm like, this is what happened. This is why I'm like this, you know, this is what it is. Before I, I didn't shave my head, right? I would grow hair, but I have a big scar on my head from getting beat by my dad. And he kicked me in my back down these stairs and I tumbled down the stairs and my head cracked open. So that's how it would start. Kids would ask me, oh, what's that scar from on your head? How'd you get that scar on your head? And then I would tell them, oh, it's because of this, you know? Or they'd be like, hey man, how come your last name's Chun, but you're black? And I'd be like, oh, because I'm adopted, you know, my mom's Korean. And I got in trouble at school. I was like a rascal. I wasn't disrespectful, I was just a kid, you know, like rascal, like, you know, class clown, like to have fun. And then um, I got suspended, so my mom was like, hey, you're gonna have to just come with me today for all my errands, you know, I don't, I don't wanna leave you home alone, it might not be safe, you know, like, all right. Uh, we went to the library and I just sat down waiting for it. On the table, I swear to God, there was a copy of Subway Art and I didn't know what graffiti was really, 
back then I was into like, you know, Dragon Ball Z and like, I would try to draw it. But I saw this book and I was like, oh, what's this? And it was just so colorful and crazy looking. And I was like, whoa, this is cool, you know? And I said, hey mom, can I borrow this? She's like, yeah, you can borrow it. And then I went home and tried to draw those, the, like the pieces. And I didn't even understand what it was. And I knew I seen it somewhere before and I, I just couldn't comprehend. And then later on that day, we were driving some more and I realized, oh, this is where I seen it out on the street. And then every time I would see graffiti, it would make me feel this, like, like this excitement in here, right? I didn't realize even though like it was illegal or what, or it was bad or good, or I just knew like, this is cool. It's making me feel something cool inside. I want to learn all about that. From there, that, that's how it, it kind of started. And then um, I get introduced to skateboarding in the ninth grade. I had a really, really dear friend of mine. His name is Luke Sabalos. He's like, hey man, you, you do graffiti? I was like, yeah. He's like, how come we don't skate? He's like, a lot of my friends that skate do graffiti. You should skate too. I was like, oh, I don't really have a skateboard, man. I can't buy one, you know? He's like, I'll tell you what, man. We all skate at City Mill after school. I'll bring you one. You should come skate, you know? And I showed up, boom, he had a board for me. And then that was it, man. Once I start, stepped on that thing, it was over. I was like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. And like all the homies that I already knew, that were already my good friends, cause we would bodyboard a lot, you know? But I didn't skate. They would, after bodyboarding, I'd go home, they'd go skate. But now it was like, oh, now I'm skating too. Like I get it now. Like, oh, this is the shit, you know? And that was it. And he was older, he was a senior. I was a, a freshman. And you know, he was one of my first like real mentors. Like he'd always pick me up you know, to go skate, and he was already hella good. I was still learning how to ollie, how to no side this full skating handrails already. And he never, you know, I always thought about it, like he never had to do that for me, you know? He never, he just took me under his wing for some reason, you know? It, it was really dope of him that he did that for me, you know? It, it really opened up so much doors for my life. You know, and I owe him a lot, but um, he sadly he passed away, he was, uh, he got hit by a drunk driver riding his motorcycle, you know? I did get to see him later on in life and thank him, you know, for everything and all that stuff. I remember Dyson and our friend Sean, they got sponsored first. Everyone was like, oh, well shit, it, it's possible. These fools got sponsored, you know? We all worked at Blue Hawaii and, and Rod, he's like another mentor for all of us. Like, that's like a, a father figure to a lot of us kids, man, that, you know, Shout out Rod, you know, Shaka's and Aloha's, man. Um, but I remember just, he was like, hey man, like, we're putting together a team, we want you to be on it. And I was like, for real? Like, fuck yeah, this is sick, you know? And then from there, it opened up more doors, like, oh, you skate for 84? Oh, you skate for Lakai? And I remember, I remember Rod taking me to show my sponsor tape to this guy, Brad, he was the rep for Lakai. And I just remember thinking, oh man, like all nervous, like fuck. And then sent him the tape, boom, right then and there. It was, it was just like that. Oh yeah, I can flow you. It wasn't like main team, but it was just flow, you know, like we're flowed. But we were getting five shoes a month. And I was like, dang, like five shoes a month. And I remember my homeboy, Black Ricky, he was on the streets, whatever. So I would always give him one pair. Like, hey fool, I got you. We were the same size, you know, so I would just give him one pair, you know? But I remember just getting five shoes a month out and being stoked. Yeah, you know? And I was like, dude, this is flow. Like, this is amazing. And then after that, I met this dude, Seth. I didn't even show him a sponsor tape. He just heard of me and was like, oh, you're, oh, you're that dude, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dyson tells me you want to ride for Hurley. We can flow you for sure, no problem. And my other friends, my great friends, Sancho and uh, Nick Yamasato, they also were on Hurley. So they were like vouching for me too. And so it, it wasn't even, I didn't show no tape, nothing. They just vouched for me and then boom, I was on Hurley. Basically they have a store for friends and family and people are sponsored that's on their warehouse. And you go in, you grab stuff, they ring it up, but it's all free. They just basically ring it up to keep track of what they're giving away, right? So I remember I grabbed like four things. I didn't want to look greedy, you know? And I didn't know what you're allowed to grab. So I grabbed like four things 
I'm like, hey, Dyson, look, I got like this, this hoodie, these jeans. He's all full. You, you, you should probably grab more. I'm like, really? He's like, bro, grab whatever you want. I'm telling you right now, they don't give a fuck. I'm like, all right. So I grab a couple more things. He's like, call me more. He's like, trust me, dude. Like they want you to wear this shit. You're sponsored by them. Like we're about to go on tour. Like obviously they want you to be wearing the shit. So I'm like, all right. I grab a bunch of stuff, right? I bring it up. I'm kind of nervous. Cause I'm like, I don't want them to be like, oh, you grab too much and be all embarrassed. And they're like, this is it. You don't want any more. And even then I'm like, yeah, this is, when they rang it up, it was like over a grand worth of stuff. And they were still like, yeah, you can grab more stuff. And I was like, no, this is good. This is, I'm good, you know? And I was like, wow. And I remember going home and me and Dyson took all our old clothes out of our, our suitcase and put all our new Hurley stuff in. Cause we were about to go on a tour with, uh, with Duff's to make a wish. And um, actually that was a tour where the last time I saw my friend Luke, I talked about earlier, he was at Make-A-Wish in Texas. But uh, yeah, so we went on this tour, like fresh, like brand new everything, it was awesome. Like when I was doing the skateboard thing, I still would, uh, you know, do graffiti and stuff, but it wasn't the main focus, but it was still there. Like I remember on tour, we went to skate this bowl in the middle of the desert. And I remember I always would bring spray paint. And so I remember doing a little piece in the bowl before we sessioned it. Cause I was like, ooh, if I, do a, if I do a piece in here, it'll be in the photos we get, you know? And if any of these photos make it to the mags, it'll be in the mag. So I would do stuff like that, you know, just to, you know, keep it going. But it wasn't like I was out painting every day, doing murals, bombing. Like I would just, it was a here and there thing at the time, you know, cause I was just living. Like even the thought of turning pro wasn't really like, I wasn't trying, I just was, I had opportunities. I had, I got to hang out with great people and I just was skating. It wasn't like, I gotta film a video part. I gotta turn pro. I gotta like, which if I did, maybe I would have turned pro. Maybe if I, but at the time we were like cruising. It was like, I don't know. We had money, we had free clothes, free skate stuff. You know, like our friends weren't charging us rent to live at their house. We were just on skate vacay for like a couple years, you know, and it was cool, man. I was probably 21 to 24, maybe 23. I stayed, I stayed there for a while. And then um, I did come back to Hawaii eventually. I started working at Blue Hawaii. They opened a location in Kalihi. You know, it was like a gallery slash, you know, skate surf store. And so we would throw art shows there and then they made me the shop manager and the buyer. So I would go to like, you know, the trade shows and all that stuff and meet all these people and talk to all these reps. So I was doing that stuff and helping them curate shows at that space. And which, you know, me and my friends would do group shows there and solo shows and stuff like that. So it was really fun. So, you know, Rod really set that up for us to really, you know, open many more doors from that. And we would do shows with Ruka there and fashion shows with certain people. And we did a lot of fun stuff there, actually. Uh, David Cho would come through, a lot of people, you know, from Ruka especially. So what happened was Blue Hawaii closed, ends up closing down. So then I'm like, okay, I gotta get a normal job now, right? My friend Sancho, he was a A plus leader you know, like after school care, right? He's like, hey dude, they're hiring, man. It's a, such an easy job. He's like, you're good with kids. He's like, it's easy, bro. You'll, you'll love it. I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. It's close by my house, whatever. So I end up working there. I have a great friend, uh, Vince, and he knew I did graffiti and he saw my work before and he's all, he's like, you like this job? I'm like, yeah, man, the kids are cool. He's like, he's like, bro, you, you'd probably be a good tattooer. And at this point I already had tattoos. We were getting tattooed already at 808 Tattoo. And you know, we were friends with all Billy and Chris Sawyer and all these guys. You know, he was like, bro, you should tattoo, man. And I was like, ah, I don't want a tattoo. He's like, you'd probably be good at it. And I was like, I don't know, you know? I just didn't like the idea of having to do artwork that I didn't want to do. I was young minded to it. I wasn't thinking of all the possibilities and stuff like that. And then one day he comes in and he's all, hey man, here's a machine, just in case. Just take this, 
and see what happens. You know, I'm like, all right. So I have a machine, but I don't do nothing with it. And at the same time, one of my best friends and crewmate, um, my boy uh, Red, you know, we did graffiti together a long time, you know, and uh, he's like, hey fool, I got all this tattoo shit. You want to come over? Let's try to do some tats. I was like, fuck it, all right. And my buddy Darren was with me. I was like, hey Darren, can I do a tattoo on you? And he's all, yeah man, let's go over there. So me and Red do our first tattoos in his living room. And you know, it wasn't the greatest, but it kind of was fun. And me and Red were like, this is actually kind of cool. So then I reached back out to my buddy Vince. Hey man, I did a tat. He's all for real? I was like, yeah, dude, I, I think I kind of want to get into it, man. And so he would come to my house and I would tell all the homies wanted tattoos. So they're all like, I was like, yeah, I'm doing them for free at my house. I got to learn. So everyone, Dyson, the homie Marshy, Dennis, just all the homies, Sancho, all my homies, dude, were such great friends, you know, and lending me skin and letting me practice. I did some terrible tattoos for sure, but I did some cool ones too, you know? But he would come over, my buddy Vince, and kind of guide me, you know? He was like, okay, this is all I can teach you, but you should really get a real apprenticeship. And I was like, all right, for sure. So I, I would go to 808 Tattoo every Thursday and just hang out and watch. And I would show Billy pictures like, hey, look at this I did. And he would be like, oh, the line works good, but the shading is fucking terrible. And so I would go home and try to, you know, do a new one. And then next Thursday, hey, Billy, what do you think about this one? Oh, sick, the shading's good now, but the line works shitty. And so I was like, ah, oh, fuck, all right. So I was just trying to figure it out. And then I would, every Thursday, I'd just be going there until Billy finally offered me an apprenticeship. And so, but right before that, the homie Libra offered me one. So I was like, oh, Libra just offered me one. And then Billy said, it's okay, you can, you can apprentice at both. But there's gonna be a day where you're gonna have to choose which shop you wanna be at. I already talked to Libra, it's cool. So you're gonna go there, you're gonna switch every day. I was like, all right, cool, man. And I, it was super cool that they even did that for me, you know? So I was apprenticing, going back and forth. And then basically, you know, the time came and I, you know, I went with 808. And being apprenticed at 808, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I mean, at the time, I fucking hated it. Those guys are great, don't get me wrong. Those are my brothers right there. We're all skinheads, we're all family, we're all fucking, you know, but those motherfuckers put me through it for sure, you know? But it made me, it made me who I am in this tattoo game, you know? And I'll forever be grateful for that, you know? After my apprenticeship was up, I, I went back to Long Beach for a little bit. I worked with my buddy Flox. He had a shop called uh, Nitty's Tattoo in San Diego. And then um, ended up coming back to Hawaii. We were gonna open a shop out here in Wahiwa actually. But it just fell through for some reason. And you know, my buddy Flox was like, oh man, I feel bad. Like you moved all your shit back here. And I was like, it's okay. I'll find a job out here, no worries, bro. I, I wanna stay out here anyway. Like I love Hawaii. I'm gonna stay here for a while. So I ended up finding a job out here and then just, you know, jumped around to a couple shops and then ended up opening my own shop in Milani. It was called Good Life Gallery Tattoos. And we had that shop for about five years and we would throw art shows there. Same kind of concept, like tattoo shop gallery. And then after that, I ended up working in Waikiki for a little bit. And then I moved back to the mainland and I was tattooing at a paper crane for like three years. Yeah, just like, oh, I'm gonna go travel and have fun, you know? And you know, I would tattoo guest spot at a bunch of shops. And then I came back and that's when I started working here at Rising Tide. And the shop was doing great. It's such a great shop. Maybe like a year, two years ago, the shop started kind of going down and like, you know, just certain things and entities that were coming through the shop and just started to make the shop really like, bad you know the shop wasn't really being taken care of i don't i'm not gonna just blame anybody for it it's just just shit wasn't being held to a certain standard things just weren't being done the right way you know the shop suffered because of it you know and a lot of people left because of it and two like i was gonna leave but you know donnie you know, he's my friend, we're Freemasons together. The first rule of like Freemasonry, you help your, help your brother, you know? So I was like, ah, instead of just bouncing on him, maybe I'll try to help him first and see what, see what he wants to do, you know, cause he's the owner. 
at the time. So I'm like, hey, what should we do, man? Because this shit is going down. Like, the electric shut off. Like, it is not good, bro. It's not looking good. And there's people who depend on this place to make money. So we need to figure it out. And I told him, you know, I can take over. You know, you can still be part owner. We'll own it together. But I'll come in and I'll, I'm going to change everything. You know, I'm going to clean it up. People aren't going to like it because people have habits and I'm going to have to break those habits and I'll be the bad guy and do it. But that's what's going to be necessary to make the shop not close down. But if you want it to close down, then fuck it. But if not, I'll take the reins and we'll get it cracking. And so he said, yeah, dude, I need help. Fucking do what you got to do. Let's bring it back to life. So in December is when I took over and, and became, you know, part owner and just basically cleaned house. Yeah, so like six months I've owned this shop and just cleaned house and really, you know, trying to get it back to where it's at. It's hard because the reputation it had was super good and then the reputation it has now is kind of bad because of just activities that were going on here. And so now what I'm dealing with is I really got to show people, oh, this is a new, brand new shop basically. It's not, it ain't the same, it ain't, it ain't that bad juju anymore. This is a great shop and, you know, slowly but surely we're working on it. We're bringing it back to life. And I'm really, really proud. And all the workers here are such great help, you know, like shout out Lauren, Kea, you know, these, those two dudes really, really helped out, you know. You know, I never was like, I want to be this when I grow up. It was more of the things I was into. I was like, I want to be good at this. So graffiti, I was like, I want to be good at graffiti. Skateboarding, I want to be good at this. I want to, it was never like, even the pro, I was never like, I want to be pro. It was like, I just want to be good, you know? And yeah, see what happens, you know what I mean? So, you know, during powwow, we would try to like figure out, oh, what are we going to paint? Like, cause sometimes they were like, hey, we don't want letters, but you guys can paint in this event, but you got to paint something besides letters. So we're like, all right. So that kind of kickstarted it. like and made us think outside the box. Like, okay, well, we can't paint letters. That's what we're used to. Let's try to paint shapes, characters, whatever, imagery, you know? And then it wasn't honestly, for me, the mural game didn't really kick off or start until like five years ago. When, uh, I mean, I was painting murals and stuff during powwow and stuff like that, but the actual like really getting down was about five years ago when I met um, another great mentor and friend of mine, uh, Tristan Eaton. I met him during powwow and I always liked his work. He's amazing, he's one of the greatest. And I seen him painting, so I was like, oh, that's the dude, you know, let me go talk to him and like pick his brain and yeah. maybe I can learn something. You know, so I end up talking to him and literally, I'm gonna tell you right now, one fucking conversation can change your whole life. So by me talking to this dude, literally changed the whole course of my life now. Because of him, it was like, now I can paint a portrait. Now I can, I, I understand what it takes to paint a real mural. Like the other shit I was painting before, I was like, eh. But now I know like seeing his work ethic and working alongside him on jobs that he has and like being up on suspended scaffolding, like 10 stories up and all this stuff, it's like, it, it takes a lot. And it's like, this shit is hard work. It's no joke, you know, and like him, taking me under his wing and really mentoring me and teaching me, taught me so much and it's kind of overwhelming, you know, and he introduced me to this crazy art world outside of Hawaii, which, you know, I, I knew was there, but I didn't know the depth of it, you know, and this shit is deep and it's like, there's so many amazing, talented human beings in this world that work hella hard. And that motherfucker is one of the hardest working people I know. And if you, I'm gonna tell this on camera right now, if you wanna fucking be a great artist or something, you're gonna have to work really hard because this shit, the, I see what he does and where he's at and that's, it, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot. So, you know, I'm still figuring out, it's been five years, I've been in the game of, you know, painting murals and stuff. I'm still trying to find my like identity, I guess, in that. Because graffiti is different, like you have a name, you have your style you have your approach, you know, but mural shit, it's, it's hard to stand out these days. There's so many muralists. Yeah, he, he introduced me to a lot of people, which these people offered me opportunities, you know, 
and I'm super grateful for. Yeah, definitely because of him, like Miami, New York, I painted stuff because of him. And actually we started a crew together called Monsters Crew, which is me, Tristan Eaton, uh, Jairo, uh, Rabbi, and our buddy Shane from Paris. And uh, we're actually gonna do a crew uh, mural festival in August in Indiana. So I'm pretty excited for that. Yeah, Monsters Crew shout out, you know. I would say this, the, the best advice I'd give anyone is don't be shy, man, and work hard. Like, the people you look up to, those are the people you should be talking to and listening to. The, the people who have done what you want to do, th those guys, talk to them. There's going to be a lot of haters talking in your ear, saying this and that, but if, if they haven't done what, what you're trying to do, you don't got to listen to those fools. But the people who have done what you want to do and are, are where you want to be, be friends with them. You know, like don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to talk to them. Don't be afraid to go up and say, hey, introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Ryan. Hey, I'm so-and-so. I, I really like your work. Like, how did you get here? Like, you know, ask them for advice. Ask them for, you know, because they've done it, you know? And networking is key, like in anything. And just working hard on your craft. You guys can come by Rising Tide. We're located in Wahiwa. Uh, we're open every day except Wednesday. Uh, come by the layups located inside the tattoo shop. We have all your spray paint, graffiti needs. Uh, give a shout out to um, just all the homies, everyone at the shop, all my graffiti crews, AP, OLUE. Shout out to my girl. She always helps out. Yeah, and just everyone that's helped me along the way. I have much respect, you know, appreciation.